Hello everybody, this is Glenn Berry with Dr. DMV, and this is Dr. DMV with Jupyter Notebooks. Before we jump into the actual presentation, I want to spend a minute to talk about PASS and everything it has to offer. This includes the PASS Pro membership, local user groups, SQL Saturday events, virtual groups, and of course, this year we've got the PASS Virtual Summit. Now, after you watch this presentation, please fill out the evaluation and make sure you do it before November 20th. If you do, you've got a chance to win some prizes and your feedback is very important to me, seriously, and to the PASS organization. Also, this is my yay me slide and this has my contact information, including my Twitter handle where I'm very active and my email address. And then I've got my blog there and my YouTube channel. So there's lots of ways to get in touch with me and see more content that I've developed over the years. So I know how to brew beer and I've been doing all grain brewing five gallon batches for about five years. It's a very fun hobby that I really enjoy. I also have a couple of miniature dachshund puppies. Uh, the red female, her name is Andui, and the male black and tan's name is Chiriso. He's a little bit older and quite a bit bigger than Andui right now. So let's talk about the actual agenda for this session. We're going to talk about the diagnostic query structure of my diagnostic queries, how they're set up, and the history of these queries real quickly, and then talking a little bit about how to use a Jupyter Notebook instead of SQL Server Management Studio to run these queries. And then we're actually going to walk through all the queries from the SQL Server 2019 version of my diagnostic query. So that's what we're going to cover in this two and a half hour session. So if you have been a database administrator for any amount of time, you know that people tend to notice when you've got any kind of problems with your database server from a performance point of view. And people tend to notice that really quickly. And also DBA actually stands for default blame acceptor. The database is always guilty until proven innocent. And when somebody complains about an application being slow or a website being slow that's backed up by a database, they always assume that it's SQL Server's fault. And I actually got really tired of hearing that many years ago when I was a production DBA. And I wanted to have a way to figure out what is actually wrong, if anything, with the database server or any of the databases that are running on it. And a lot of times, it's not even really a database problem. So I wanted to develop some queries that would let me prove that one way or another, both to myself and to others. So that's where these queries came from. And DMV queries were added to SQL Server way back in SQL Server 2005. And that was one of the reasons a lot of organizations were very enthusiastic about upgrading from SQL Server 2000 to SQL Server 2005. And every new version of SQL Server since then has additional DMV queries or additional columns to existing queries. And so this makes this very applicable to all versions of SQL Server after 2005. And also I've got separate versions of this for Azure SQL Database and SQL Managed Instance. And you get lots of very useful information from these queries from a configuration point of view and your workload, what's going on with that and your performance bottlenecks. So you get a very comprehensive view of your instance and of an individual database on your SQL Server instance. So these queries are set up with instance level queries at the beginning. So it doesn't matter what database you're connected to when you run the instance level queries. And then the second rough, roughly half of these queries is database specific queries. And it makes a big difference what database you're connected to. So make sure you're not connected to the master database or MSDB, connect to a user database that you're actually concerned about. Moving on, here's what Azure Data Studio looks like. And if you haven't downloaded this, you can just Google download Azure Data Studio and it'll take you to a link where you can download the install for this. And also SQL Server Management Studio version 18.7 also includes an install for this, which is sort of a controversial move on Microsoft's part. But any way you want to get this, once you have the tool, it's a cross-platform tool that runs on Linux and Mac OS and also on Windows, and it lets you connect to a SQL Server instance that could be running on Windows or Linux. None of that really matters as long as you can connect to it over the network. And after that, 
I've got some information here about where can you get these queries? Because that's one question that always comes up when I present on this subject. And so I've got two links here. One is the add direct link to the resources page on my website, and the other is a bit.ly shortcut to the same location. And all these queries you're gonna see are completely free. There's no registration or anything else required. Just go and download them, and then you can use them as you see fit. So now without any further ado, we're gonna go ahead and run all of these diagnostic queries in Azure Data Studio. All right, I've got a Jupyter Notebook opened up in Azure Data Studio. And it looks a little bit different here than it does in SQL Server Management Studio, but once you get used to the differences, it won't be a big problem. And we've got the different cells here that can have documentation, they're text cells, or you can have query cells. And I've got all the query cells collapsed right now. So query number one is version info, and that's SQL Server and operating system information from the current instance is what this is about. And I have documentation underneath one of the, each one of these in text cells, as you see right here. So we can expand this query cell, and you can see the complete query. And then over here at the left, you have a little arrow that lets you run the currently active cell. So when I do that, and then you wait a little bit sometimes, it'll come back with the results. And now we can see right here are the results from this query. And if we expand this, you can see the complete results. So this shows us the name of the server right there. And then it tells us it's SQL Server 2019 RTM CU8, the exact build number. And then it tells you that it's developer edition and it's running on Windows 10 Professional Edition. So that's useful information that I wanna know. I wanna know in real life on an actual database server, am I running Standard Edition or am I running Enterprise Edition? And I wanna know what version and edition of SQL Server that I'm dealing with. And I wanna know the exact build number so I can tell if I'm up to date on my cumulative updates, for example. And in this case, I am. I've got the latest and greatest cumulative update for SQL Server 2019. And while I'm at it, SQL Server 2019 doesn't have service packs, just like SQL Server 2017 doesn't. All they have are cumulative updates, and that's how Microsoft pushes out bug fixes and feature enhancements to the product. And you wanna to try to stay up to date is much as you can. Now that doesn't mean throwing the latest CU into production the day that it comes out with no testing, but you don't wanna never update to a CU either. You need to find a happy medium that works for your organization and try to stay as current as possible. Next we have query number two. So if we scroll down a little bit to get this to the top of the window here, what I do for each one of these queries is I have a short description of what it does. So right here, you can see that. And then I have the query number and then a very short name for the query. And I've got this cell collapsed and I can expand it so you can see what the query actually is. In this case, it's running an extended store procedure. It's not a DMV query. So you can go ahead and run this query by hitting the run cell button and it comes back with the results, and you can drag this over just like this. And what this is showing us, this is reading the SQL Server error log, and it's telling us how many sockets and how many physical cores per socket and how many total logical processors per socket that it can see and how many total logical processors for the entire system that SQL Server can see and how many is it using. And this happens every time SQL Server starts up, it writes this information of the SQL Server error log. Now, if you recycle your error log since you last restarted SQL Server, this query will come back empty the way it's written. But why this query is important is that it tells you what's happening with your SQL Server licensing and whether or not SQL Server actually is using all the cores and sockets in your system, whether it's a virtual machine or bare metal. And where this comes into play a lot of times is if you have SQL Server Standard Edition and you install it on a VM or a bare metal machine that has more sockets or more cores than you're allowed to use. So this will let you see that, that you have a problem. So maybe you've got 64 cores in your system, for example, and you're only allowed to use 24 of them with SQL Server Standard Edition. That will show up right here. So this is a very handy query for that. The next query in the set is query number three, which is server properties. 
And if we scroll this up to the top of the window, you can see it right here. And we'll go ahead and expand the code so you can see the entire query. And what's happening here is just calling select server property with different input parameters to pull back a lot of useful information about your SQL Server instance. So we'll go ahead and run that. And it comes back and you can see that we have a lot of interesting information here. So machine name is freedom nine, server name is freedom nine. The instance is null, which means I have a default instance. I don't have a failover cluster. Here's my net BIOS name. I'm running developer edition and it's CU8. And here's the build number. And as we scroll across, you can see what the collation is for the instance. And we can see that full text search is not installed. And we keep on going over to the right, these three columns right here, instance default data path, instance default log path, are very useful. So now we know where the default data path and the default log path is at the instance level. And that's what, if you just say create database, those files will go there, for example. So that's a lot of useful information that we get from this query. And I'll go ahead and collapse this cell back. The next query in the set is query number four, configuration values. And this is just going to return the instance level configuration values for the instance that you're currently connected to. So if I come and expand this window, it's just hitting the sys.configurations system table. And I'll go ahead and kick this off. And it comes back with the results. And these are in alphabetical order, the names of these instance level settings. So if we expand this over a little bit, you can see, and depending on what version of SQL Server you're working with, you'll have a different number here. SQL Server 2019 has 85 different configuration values that you can take a look at. And what we wanna do here is just focus on certain ones that are most important in my opinion. So ones that I like to look at are backup checksum default, I think that should always be enabled. Backup compression default should be enabled in most cases. I wanna know whether or not the CLR is enabled or not. That's required by some databases, but if it's not required, you don't wanna have that turned on. I also wanna see what the cost threshold for parallelism is. The default value for that is five, and for a lot of OLTP workloads, that can be too low. So you might wanna change that after running some other queries to figure out a good value. Another thing that I like to look at is max server memory and max degree of parallelism. So here's max degree of parallelism, and that's set to eight right now. And that's something the SQL Server 2019 setup program can set for you automatically if you let it. Otherwise, you can do it yourself. The max server memory is in megabytes, and you wanna set that to a low enough value so that the operating system is never under any memory pressure. And then one of the other ones that I always wanna take a look at is right here, optimize for ad hoc workloads. And I believe that should be enabled for almost every single instance. There's very few reasons you'd ever not want to have that turned on, in my opinion. So those are some of the more important ones. And if I scroll down a little bit in the documentation, you can see that I've got some documentation that explains what I think these values should be in most cases. So I think that's a useful query. And almost every time I run this on somebody's system, I find some things that probably are not set correctly for that system. So this is a place to find things that need to be fixed. The next query in this set is query number five, which is global trace flags. And this just gives you a list of all the global trace flags that are enabled right now. So when I run this query, it's just dbcc trace status negative one. It shows me that I've got trace flag 3226 enabled and also 7745. And 3226 has to do with suppressing the logging of successful database backup messages. Because if you don't have that trace flag enabled, every time you take any kind of a database backup, it writes a message to the SQL Server error log that tells you that the backup was successful. And most of the time they are successful, right? So if you have many databases and you're taking frequent transaction log backups, you can have a huge amount of entries in your error log telling you every single time that a database backup 
was successful. And if you turn on this trace flag, it stops logging all the successful database backups. It still will log the ones that fail, and you can still query MSDB and find out about any ones that failed. So this really makes your SQL Server error logs smaller. And then the other one I have turned on is 7745. And that just keeps query stored data from being written to disk if you try to shut down SQL Server or fail over. And that can help you avoid problems if you've got a big workload with lots of ad hoc queries and there's a, a lot of stuff going on with Query Store. So it's a good idea to turn that on. And SQL Server 2019 just doesn't need as many trace flags as older versions of SQL Server did. So that's some progress that Microsoft's been making with newer versions of SQL Server. The next query in this set is SQL Server Process Address Space, and that's query number six, Process Memory. And this tells you how much memory SQL Server is actually using, the SQL Server process. So we'll kick that off, and we'll see when it comes back. So that comes back and shows us that SQL Server is actually only using about 1,485 megabytes of memory. And you can also see that lock pages allocation is zero and that means lock pages and memory is not enabled and that's on purpose on my workstation if this was a regular server i would want to have that enabled in most cases now rather than taking task manager's word for it we can see how much memory sql server is actually using and whether or not lock pages and memory is enabled or not the next query in the set is query number seven which is sql server services info and this shows just tells you some useful information about your SQL Server service accounts. So when I run this query, it comes back and we can see that I've got the SQL Server database engine on the top row and the SQL Server agent service on the bottom row. And they're both set up to automatically start up. They're both running. And one thing that's really important that you get back from this query is the last startup time for the database engine. And that's really important to know when you're interpreting the results of some of the other queries in this set. And then I can see my service account. And these are the built-in service accounts, which are not really best practice for a real server. And you can tell that it's not a failover cluster instance. And you can also tell that instant file initialization is enabled for the instance, which I think is a good idea for most instances. And you can enable that when you install SQL Server on SQL Server 2016 and newer, or you can use local group policy editor to enable it later on. This is a useful query that tells you some good information. The next query in this set is query number eight, last backup by database. And this just shows you the last backup for full backups, differential backups, and log backups for every single database on your instance, including the system databases. So when we kick this off, it'll come back and it shows us all the databases right here and the recovery model for each database and the log reuse weight description for each database. And that's important to keep track of in real life because if you've got a problem that's keeping the log from clearing, it'll show up in log reuse weight description. And you need to investigate that if something is happening there so you don't have a runaway transaction log. And then you can see the last full backup when it finished for that database. And then the last differential backup and when that finished and the last log backup and when that finished. So it's nice to be able to see this for all the databases on your instance just from running one query. The next query in the set is query number nine, which is SQL Server Agent Jobs. And this query just tells you a little bit of information about every SQL Server agent job that you have. And that's nice to know if you've got many, many agent jobs. So when I go ahead and start this query, it'll come back in a couple seconds. And I can, you can see that I've got the Ola Hallengren maintenance solution jobs in here. And it shows you the job name right there, and then the job description, and then the job owner, which you want to be SA in most cases rather than somebody's individual login. And you can see when the job was created. And then you can see that each job is enabled in this case. And then finally, what I want to know is, are all the schedules enabled? Because if you have a, a job, even if it's enabled, and there's no schedule for the job, it's never going to run automatically. So this gives you a good high-level overview of all your SQL Server agent jobs.
Our next query is query number 10, which is SQL Server Agent Alerts. And this just gives you some high-level information about all your SQL Server Agent Alerts. Now, a lot of DBAs, in my experience, don't even really know what SQL Server Agent Alerts are. They're different from SQL Server Agent Jobs. It's something you can go in and create, and it's a good idea to do this so you can find out whether or not you have some certain kinds of errors happening that you might not normally see because they just go to the SQL Server error log. So when I run this query, it'll come back and show me all the SQL Server agent alerts that I have created on this instance. And this is, I have a script that you can download that will create all these alerts for you and it picks up the name of the server and puts it in the name of the alert. So you can see the name of each one of the alerts there and then you can see over here that the delay res between responses is set up to 900 seconds, which is 15 minutes. And the idea here is most of these have to do with pretty severe software or hardware errors. And if you see any of these occurring, you wanna do some more investigation to see what might be going on. And normally these just go into the SQL Server error log and you might not notice them for a while, but having the alert in place you can tie the alert to a notification. So if the alert fires, you can have it notify a SQL operator with an email, and that might be tied to a distribution list so that multiple people in your organization know that, hey, this Freedom 9 server has a pretty severe problem that we should investigate now rather than later. The next query in this set is query number 11, which is host info. It used to be that this was Windows information only for this query, but they added a new DMV in SQL Server 2017 because SQL Server 2017 and newer will run on Linux or it will run on Windows. So you need to find out what platform are you actually running on. So when I run this query, it'll come back and tell me that in this case, I'm running on Windows and I'm running on Windows 10 Professional Edition and my language version is 1033, which is English. Now I know some information about what I'm running on instead of having a guess, and that's useful to know. The next query in the set is query number 12, which is SQL Server NUMA info. And this is gonna tell us information about how many schedulers are on each NUMA node. And when I run this query, it'll come back on my system and it shows two rows. So I've got an AMD Ryzen 9 3950X processor in my workstation, and that shows up as two NUMA nodes here. But you can see that I've got 16 schedulers online on both NUMA nodes. What you wanna look at on a real server is whether or not the number of schedulers is equal because if you install SQL Server Standard Edition on a machine that has more than four sockets or more than 24 cores, you can potentially have a situation where you have a, an unequal number of schedulers on each NUMA node, and that's something you can fix with an alter server configuration command, but this will help you figure out if you actually have that problem or not. The next query in this set is query number 13, which is system memory, and this just tells you how much memory your operating system has and whether or not you're under external memory pressure or not, and this reads from a SysDM OS sys memory. So when I run this query, it's gonna come back and show me that I've got 64 gigs of memory in my machine, and I've got about 54 gigs almost of memory is available. And then it tells me some information about the page file, which I don't really care about that much, to be honest, with SQL Server. But what I do care about is the system memory state. And you want it to say available physical memory is high. That means that you're not under external memory pressure. The operating system is happy about how much memory it has available. But what it might say is physical memory usage is steady or available physical memory is low or available physical memory is running low or physical memory is transitioning. And you don't wanna see any of those. You want it to be available physical memory is high. And that means your operating system has plenty of memory. The next three queries in this set are ones that you can skip if you know you don't have a traditional failover cluster instance or you don't have any availability group clusters or availability groups on this instance. But I'm gonna go ahead and talk about them and, and run them real quickly. So the first one is query 14, cluster node properties. And this is the one you would use if you had a traditional failover cluster instance. And it's looking at SysDMOS cluster nodes and when I run it here, it'll come back and it'll be empty on my workstation because I'm not part of a failover cluster, 
but it would show me the node name and the status description, and then whether or not that node is the current owner of the SQL Server instance in that failover cluster. So that's handy if you do have a traditional failover cluster instance. The next one is query 15, which is AG cluster. So you have an availability group cluster. It'll tell you some information about that as far as the name of the cluster and what kind of quorum you have set up, and then the quorum state description. And then finally, if I go down here, if I did have an availability group or multiple availability groups on this SQL Server instance, this would hit several different DMVs to tell me some high level information about each one of the availability groups. So this is very useful if you do have an availability group, but I don't on my workstation. The next query in this set is query number 17, which is hardware info. And this is one of my favorite queries since I like hardware so much. So we'll go ahead and run this query and then we'll talk about what information comes back from it. When this comes back on my machine, it tells me that I've got 32 logical CPUs with 32 schedulers. So normally the logical CPU count and the scheduler count should match. Then I have 16 physical cores with one socket and 16 cores per socket. And then because of this AMD CPU that I'm using, it shows up as two NUMA nodes. And it shows me I have 64 gigs of RAM. And then the max worker count is 960. And it's using automatic processor affinity right here. And then SQL Server started on October 26th at 7.12 a.m. And knowing that is very important so you can interpret some of the other queries in this set. It's only been up for 29 hours since then. And then it shows a virtual machine type of none. And what that means is that there's no hypervisor present on this uh, workstation that I'm running. I don't have Hyper-V or anything else like that installed. Soft NUMA configuration is turned on. And then I'm using conventional for the memory model description. That means I don't have lock pages in memory enabled on my workstation. And that is on purpose. But this gives you all this useful information about your hardware because some DBAs are not allowed to log in directly to the database server and they can only run Management Studio or Azure Data Studio remotely on a jump box or from their workstation. So this lets you peer into some of the hardware details that you want to know about if you're a good DBA, in my opinion. You should not just leave this to others to worry about. Understanding what kind of hardware you have is useful for a DBA and for consultants. The next query in the set is query number 18, which is system manufacturer. And they're just reading the SQL Server error log to look for the word manufacturer and if you've recycled your SQL Server error log since you last restarted SQL Server, this will come back empty. So let's go ahead and run this query and see what comes back. And what happens on my system is that it shows system manufacturer to be filled by OEM. And the reason I'm getting that is I built this machine from parts. And so there's no OEM that's listed there. But if you run this on a real server, from Dell or HPE or Lenovo, whatever the case may be, it'll show you the manufacturer and the model number of the server. And if it's running as a VM inside of a hypervisor, it'll show you the hypervisor vendor. So it might be Microsoft or VMware or whatever the case may be. So this is how you confirm for sure whether or not you're running inside of a VM or not, because the previous query had a column that talked about a virtual machine, and that is not going to show you 100% for sure whether you're running in a VM or not, but this query does. Our next query is query number 19, which is BIOSTATE. And this just gets the BIOSTATE for the main system BIOS from the Windows registry. And this only works with Windows, not with Linux. So when I run this query, it's going to tell me that the BIOS release date is August 27, 2020. And this is only useful on physical bare metal hardware. It's not useful very much for a, a VM inside of a hypervisor. But this helps you figure out whether or not your BIOS is up to date and also gives you some indirect information about how old your hardware might be. Because if you see a really old date here, that means it's an older server that hasn't been updated. And if you see a fairly new date, that either means that you have newer hardware that's up to date, or it could be older hardware that still is releasing BIOSes that are not that old in terms of time. And it's actually important, in my opinion, for the DBA to have an idea about this because 
Many security issues, especially with Intel processors, are fixed with firmware updates that are issued as BIOS updates. And you also sometimes get other important things that are fixed. And this also gives you a little bit of knowledge about how well people have been taking care of the server. So if you look at a popular server like a Dell PowerEdge R740 and you run this and the BIOS release date is two to three years ago, that tells me at least that whoever's been taking care of this server has not been doing a very good job because they're way, way behind on BIOS releases and they're missing many critical updates. The next query in the set is query number 20, which is processor description. This is another one of my favorite queries from this set. And when I run this query, it comes back and tells me, it reads the Windows registry, so it's not gonna work on Linux, by the way, but it tells me what, exactly what kind of processor I have in my machine. So you can see that I've got an AMD Ryzen 9 3950X processor in my workstation. And it does the same thing on a regular server. So it's gonna tell you an Intel Xeon or an AMD Epic, whatever your server processor is. And once you know the model number of your server processor, you can Google that model number and you should be able to either find the Intel Arc database or the AMD product listings that tell you all the specifications for that processor along with how old it is. So then you can use that to decide whether or not you've got a slow processor or not. And that's something I really wanna know as a SQL Server DBA. The next query in this set is query number 21, which is memory dump info. And this gives you some information about the location, time, and size of any memory dumps that you might have gotten from SQL Server. And this is reading SysDM server memory dumps. So when I run this query, it comes back empty on my machine, which is that's what you wanna see. You don't want any results coming back from this because if SQL Server is having some pretty severe problems that are usually just short of crashing completely, it'll generate a memory dump. And if that's happening on a regular basis, something is wrong with your SQL Server instance. And it may just be a bug in SQL Server. And if you open a support case with Microsoft and send them these memory dumps, quite often they'll find there's a problem and issue a hotfix that becomes part of a cumulative update later and you don't want to find anything in here. And the way to try to avoid this, if you are seeing memory dumps, is to make sure you're on the latest and greatest cumulative update for your version of SQL Server. And if you're still getting them, you'd want to open a support case with Microsoft and let them look into the problem. The next query in the set is query number 22, which is suspect pages. And this just looks at the suspect pages table in the MSDB system database. And you want this also to come back empty. So let's take a look at my system. When I run this, luckily it comes back empty. But if it does not come back empty, if you get results back from this, it'll tell you the database name and the file ID in the database. So you'll be able to figure out, is it a data file or a log file? And then it'll show you the page ID. And then it shows you the event type. And I've got some documentation down here for what the event type descriptions mean. And if you are getting results back from this, that means that something bad is happening that is causing corruption within your database. And you'd want to do some investigation to try to figure out what that might be. So I would want to make sure that I was on the latest cumulative update. And I'd want to make sure that my firmware and driver versions for all my storage components and for my main system BIOS were up to date. And if I was still seeing problems, I might want to even open a case with Microsoft. But usually you don't see any results that come back from this, and that's good. And if you do see any results, that's time to start doing some deep investigation of your storage subsystem. Our next query is query number 23, which is tempdb data files. This simply reads from the SQL Server error log, and this is another query that if you've recycled your error log since the last time you restarted SQL Server, it's not going to return any results unless you change the way this query is written. So when I run this on my system, it comes back and shows me that the tempdb database has eight data files. And that's what I'm trying to find out here. 
older versions of SQL Server before SQL Server 2016 would just have one data file by default when you installed SQL Server, and you could manually go in there and add additional data files, and that was generally a good thing to do, and you wanted to make sure that all those data files were the same size and had the same auto-grow increment set. But with SQL Server 2016 and newer, the setup program lets you specify how many data files you want, and it recommends what it thinks you should use for your system. So this lets you confirm how many data files you have. And once again, only works if you have not recycled the error log since you last started SQL Server the way this query is written. Our next query is query number 24, which is database file names and paths. And this is going to take a look and pull back all the file names and paths for all the user and system databases on your current instance. So when we run this query, let's see what it pulls back. So this shows me all the database files and all the databases on my current instance. And you can see the first column is database name. This shows you the name of the database. And the reason why you see the same database name repeated is it's showing you the data file and the log file, which is the two required files you have to have for any SQL Server database. And this is the logical name in this column. The file ID, one is the primary data file in the primary file group, and then two is the log file. And if you have additional file IDs, they're usually going to be data files. And then if you take a look at the physical name, this shows you the complete path and file name to that database in your file system. So this helps you understand where are your database files located. Do you have all your data files on one drive and your log files on another drive, for example? That's important with some sorts of storage systems and not quite as important with other types of storage subsystems. Then if the next column over is type description, and rows means a data file and log means a log file. And if we scroll over to the right here, state description for the database, these are all online. Another one that's important is this is percent growth column. And you don't want to use percent growth for SQL Server databases because usually that's set at something like 1% or else 10%. And if the data file or the log file is very small, 10% or 1% growth, whatever it might be set to, is a very small increment. But as that file gets bigger and bigger, that same percentage is a bigger increment of growth. And that can cause issues, especially for your transaction log. So it's much better to go in and change the auto grow from percent based growth, like you see for some of these files here, to a fixed size in megabytes, which might be, say, 500 megabytes or 1,000 megabytes, you know, depending on how large your database is going to be and how often it grows. And then another thing you get back from this is the total size in megabytes of that file. And as we scroll down, you can see the various different sizes for some of these databases. And finally, what I want to point out here is this helps you also get the number of tempdb data files. So if the previous or one of the previous queries didn't get any results because you'd recycled your error log, this one will tell you if you look closely enough. You can see we have one tempdb log file right there and then this is the primary data file for tempdb, and then all these other ones right here are other data files for tempdb. And you'd want to take a look at where they were located, and also the fact they're all set to have the same amount of growth, and they're all the same size. That's really important for tempdb data files. Our next query is query number 25, which is fixed drives. And this gives you information about all the fixed drives visible to the operating system. At least that's what it claims to do. What you'll see here when we run it, that it actually returns fixed drives and removable drives. So when I run this query on my workstation, it comes back and shows me my C drive and then a D drive, which is a removable drive. It's a USB thumb drive in this case. And then an R drive and an S drive and it tells you the fixed drive path in the first column and what type of drive it is and then how much space it has available. It doesn't tell you, unfortunately, 
how much space it has, just the available space. And this is supposed to show you all the drives your operating system can see, regardless of whether or not you have any SQL Server database files on them, which is different than some of the subsequent queries in this set. And it's reading from sys.dmos enumerate fixed drives. So whoever wrote this DMV kind of gave it bad, a bad name in my opinion because it doesn't just show you fixed drives, it shows you removable drives on top of that. And you would not normally want to use a removable drive to host a SQL Server database file. And the reason I have this in the query set is maybe you're looking for some other place to stick a SQL Server database file temporarily. So let's say that your transaction log is a runaway transaction log and you've run out of disk space in the, on the drive where your log file lives, this will show you other drives in the system that have available space that you might be able to use for something in an emergency. Or maybe you're just thinking about creating a new database and you wanna see what drives you have available that you have that are visible that you might be able to put your SQL Server database files on. The next query in this set is query number 26, which is volume info. And this gives you volume information for all the logical drives that currently have any SQL Server database files on the current instance that you're connected to. So when I run this query, it's gonna show us all the files, we're not, I take that back. What it shows us is all the drives that have any SQL Server database files on them. And it gives us more information than we got from the previous query. It reads from sys.master files and then the sysdmos volume stats dmf. And in my case, I've got the volume mount point as the first column. And you can see that I have a C drive and an R drive and an S drive on my workstation. And then you can see the file system type. These are all NTFS. And the logical volume name, you know, I like to give volume names that tell me a little bit about the hardware. That's just kind of my habit. And then you can see the total size of the drive in gigabytes. So that's how big the drive actually is after it's formatted. And you can see the available size in gigabytes. So I've got plenty of space on all those drives, which is a good thing. And you can see the percentage of space free. And the other columns here aren't super important in my opinion. In fact, I've even thought about taking them off. But anyways, this helps you understand where your database files are and whether or not any of those drives are low on space, which is a bad thing both for if you run out of space completely and if you get low on space, it can affect performance depending on what kind of storage you're dealing with. The next query in the set is query number 27, which is drive level latency. And this gives you the cumulative average drive level latency since the last time SQL Server was started. And it's important you keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and run this query and see what it pulls back on my system. And this comes back in my case, and it shows me the C drive and the R drive and the S drive, because those are the three logical drives that I have SQL Server database files. And you can see it shows you the volume mount point right there and the drive there. And then the read latency is coming back as zero because I don't have that much of a workload on my workstation. And then the write latency is five milliseconds on the S drive. And then the overall latency is one. And it's also showing you the average bytes per read and the average bytes per write and the average bytes per transfer. And the reason why this query can be useful is it gives you a high level view at the drive level of how that drive is performing from SQL Server's perspective. And remember I told you that this is the cumulative average latency since SQL Server was started. So it's not just your nominal workload from SQL Server, it's anything that's been touching that drive from SQL Server's perspective. So things like running backups, running DBCC check DB, running index maintenance, doing restores of databases, anything like that is gonna go into these numbers. And usually these latency numbers will be higher than you're gonna see from other tools, especially SAN monitoring tools. So you can't just run this query and see a relatively high number and go screaming at your SAN administrator about how terrible the SAN is. 
this is one piece of evidence that you might have a problem, but you want to look at some of the other queries in this set and do some other investigation before you go and make an accusation like that. There's just one piece of evidence to build that picture. And if I saw high numbers here, and by high, I mean above 25 to 30 milliseconds, I would want to do further investigation to try to figure out what the problem might be. The next query in our set is query number 28, which is IO latency by file. And this takes the same virtual file stats DMV that we use in the previous query and drills down into the individual files for each database instead of aggregating for the entire logical drive. And when I run this query, it'll take a second or two to come back and it's going to show me every single database file for every database on the current instance. So it shows you the database name in the first column and then the average read latency in milliseconds for that particular file. And if we skip over here to the physical name, this tells us the actual file and where it's located. So in this case, it's on the R drive and it's the AdventureWorks LT 2008 R2 primary data file. So that's what's happening with that. Here's the average read latency for all these files and then the average write latency for all these files and then the average I.O. latency for all the files. It also tells you how big is the file, which is nice to know, in megabytes. And again, that's the physical name, so you know exactly where that lives. And then type description shows you rows or log in most cases, and rows is data files and log is a log file. If we scroll over to the right, it shows you the total amount of I.O. stalls and reads for milliseconds, and then the number of reads. And then the same thing for writes, the total number of IO stalls for writes, and the number of writes. And the reason why this is useful, this helps you start to understand what kind of an IO workload do I have for each one of these database files. So you can look at that and try to understand and start to figure out this is more of a reporting workload that's read heavy or more of an OLTP workload that's more write heavy. And you're going to see different things for data files versus log files. And if you've got any kind of HA solution in place that's touching your storage subsystem, such as transactional replication or database mirroring or availability groups, that's also going to contribute to these numbers. So instead of just guessing, about this, you actually have some numbers. And this is cumulative since SQL Server has been running. And then going back to the columns here, you can see the total number of I.O. stalls for that file and the total number of I.O. since SQL Server has been running. And then these last two columns have to do with Resource Governor. So you can use Resource Governor to limit the amount of I.O. that you get for something and this shows you whether or not resource governor has been doing that i don't have resource governor throttling io on my workstation but if i did it would show up there the next query in the set is query number 29 which is io warnings and this is looking through the six most recent sql server air log files looking for the text taking longer than 15 seconds. So that's a 15 second IO warning. And when I run this query, it's gonna look through the six most recent error logs. And this might take some time if you haven't recycled your error log for a long time or SQL Server's just been running for a long, long time. So you want it to come back empty like this. You don't wanna see any 15 second IO warnings. But if it does come back with any results, it's gonna show you the log date, so it'll tell you exactly the date and time when it happened, and it's gonna show you the process info, and then most importantly, the log text. And that's gonna tell you what file had a 15 second IO warning, so it'll tell you, you'll be able to figure out what database it was and what drive it's on, and whether it's a data file or a log file. And you wanna look at that and see if there's any kind of a pattern that you can see. So it may be that every night at 3 a.m. when you're running DBCC Check DB, you get some 15 second IO warnings for your largest databases. So that tells you one story, but you, what you might see instead is maybe you see different database files on different drives getting 15 second IO warnings with no apparent pattern. It just happens 
all over the place for different files in different locations. Well, that's pretty strong evidence that your I.O. subsystem is not performing very well, whereas the prior example just means that maybe you're doing something that temporarily overwhelms the storage subsystem. That's just something different than just seeing that it's happening all over the place with no apparent pattern. And if you see 15 second I.O. warnings on a regular basis, that's really hard for your storage administrator or SAN administrator to ignore because the previous two queries that I showed you, a lot of times you'll see very high latency number from those. And if you run and show that to your storage administrator, quite often they'll try to blow that off and say, oh, well, my SAN looks just fine. I don't see what you're talking about, Mr. DBA. But if you see these 15 second IO warnings, 15 seconds is an eternity for an I.O. to complete, and that's a lot harder for somebody to ignore. Query number 30 is RG resource pool. So this is resource governor resource pool information, and this is reading from SysDM resource governor resource pools. And what I've found over the course of my recent career is very few people out in the wild are using resource governor. So it's fairly rare to see anything interesting come back from this unfortunately but when we run the query it'll come back and show me the internal pool and the default pool that you get when you just install sql server without actually creating any resource governor resource pools yourself and if anybody had done that you could see the name of the resource pool right here and you could also see how they had set the memory settings and then the cpu settings and the iops settings so this is something that can be useful if somebody's using Resource Governor, so that's why I added this to the set. The next query in the set is Query 31, which is Database Properties. And this is a very important and useful query, so we need to pay close attention to this one. So this is going to pull back a lot of information about all the databases on your instance. And it's reading from sys.databases and also sysdmos performance counters and sysdm database encryption keys. So let's go ahead and run it. And when it comes back, we'll see some useful information about all the databases. So let's scroll down and take a look at what we get back here. The first column is database name. So that's going to be the name of all the user databases and system databases on your instance. And then the next column is the database owner. And normally you want the database owner to be SA as opposed to an individual login. And these two are here on purpose. And then recovery model is showing you the current recovery model for the database. So it could be full or simple or bulk logged. And then state description is hopefully going to be online. And then containment description if it's a contained database. And that's another SQL Server feature that's not used that often in my experience. But then we see log reuse weight description. And this is telling you what is preventing the SQL Server log file for that database from clearing. So this will help you figure out if you've got a runaway transaction log, something's preventing it from clearing. And if that's happening, that's going to make your log file grow and then fill up and grow until you run out of log space or run out of disk space on the drive where that log file lives. And then the next column is the log size in megabytes and what percentage of that or how much megabytes of that has actually been used and then the log space percentage has been used. So again, this helps you figure out if you got that runaway transaction log file and do some further investigation. The next column is database compatibility level. And this is a lot more important with modern versions of SQL Server than it used to be because it affects the cardinality estimator that you're using and it can affects whether or not certain trace flags are in effect by default without you actually having to turn them on. And also affects a lot of performance related behaviors. So you can't just do this without thinking about it. You need to do some testing with different compatibility levels to make sure you're not losing a lot of performance is the short answer there. And if we scroll over to the right to look at some of the other columns here, we can see that is mixed page allocation on. That was a new one that was added in 2016. And then the page verify option, 
And you want this to be set to checksum. You don't want to see torn page detection or none. And that's something that's easy to fix. Auto create stats on, you want that on in most cases, because that means as you create a table, it's going to automatically create statistics with it. And then auto update stats on, that should be turned on in most cases, because as the data changes over time, it'll automatically kick off statistics updates. And that may not be good enough for some really volatile tables, but it's usually better than nothing. And then auto update stats async on, I think that should be turned on, especially for OLTP databases. One place where you might not want to turn it on is a reporting workload where you want to not have that run in the background. You want query execution to halt while it automatically redoes the statistics for certain kinds of queries. But for most OLTP queries, you want to have that turned on. And then parameterization forced. That is a risky setting. It sometimes helps performance, but it's very rare. And you want to test that very heavily before you turn that on. Snapshot isolation, that's something you can use to help alleviate blocking. But you want to do some testing and make sure it doesn't cause any other issues. And the same thing for is read committed snapshot on, that's RCSI. That's another thing you can turn on at the database level to help alleviate blocking. But you want to test that before you turn it on. Auto close on and auto shrink on, both of those are terrible settings that should never be turned on in my opinion. And I've got it turned on here on purpose for this database. But if you ever see that turned on, I would wanna find out why and I would wanna just turn it off. And then target recovery time in seconds. This is very important for SQL Server 2012 with Service Pack 4 and any newer version of SQL Server with a high enough service pack. And this affects how I.O. is handled and whether it's going to use Dirty Page Manager or not. And this can help I.O. performance in many cases. So the default for most databases is to set this to something besides zero so that you get indirect checkpoints. And that can, again, help your I.O. performance in many cases. You also see, is CDC enabled? That tells you whether change data capture is enabled for the database. Is publish tells you if this is a publisher database for transactional replication. Is distributor tells you if it's a distributor. And then these next columns, these next three, group database ID and replica ID, or I should say next two, will tell you if it's part of an availability group or not. And then you can see is memory optimized elevate to snapshot. And delayed durability was a new feature in SQL Server 2014 that can improve log performance at the danger of possible data loss. And then auto create stats incremental and is query store on. Query store is a very useful feature that you can use, but you need to turn it on at the database level. It just doesn't happen automatically. And then you can see the other columns here. And I'm just finishing up scrolling to the right is encrypted is encryption state percent complete key algorithm key length those are all ones that tell you whether or not you have a transparent database encryption and how far it's along and encrypting it if it's in the middle of doing that so you can see there's a lot of properties here for your databases and every time i run this on somebody's system i find things that should be changed or fixed so this is a very useful query that you need to pay attention to. The next query in the set is query number 32, which is missing indexes for all databases on the instance. And this is going to pull back all the missing indexes for all the databases ordered by index advantage, which is a calculated number that I'll talk about in a minute. So we'll go ahead and run this query and take a look at what comes back. And this is one of the queries that I was talking about earlier that how long your SQL Server instance has been running is really important when you're interpreting the results of this query. So it makes a big difference if you've just been running for a few hours or a few days versus many weeks or months. So the first column that comes back is index advantage. And that's that calculated number that I was talking about and whether or not 5002 is significant or not depends on your workload and also depends on how long you've been running. So if you've got a pretty small workload, it 
5002 might be very significant, especially if you have not been running for a very long time. But you'll start to judge that as you work with this query and your actual servers. And then the next column that is really important to take a look at is the last user seek column. And you want to take a look at that and see whether or not it updates if you run this query again. And if it doesn't, you want to look and see how far back was it? Was it several hours ago or several days or even several weeks ago? Because if that's the case, whatever query that triggered this missing index request is probably not part of your regular workload and you might not want to pay as much attention to it. But if it's something that which just happened a few seconds ago, and then you run this query again, and it updates, that means whatever query is triggering this is being executed a lot, and it's part of your regular workload, and you probably want to pay more attention to it. The next column in the query is database schema table, and it shows you the database that this is coming back from, and then the schema, and then the table where this is happening. And this is, again, the table in the specific database that SQL Server thinks that it would like a new index on. So if we scroll over to the right here, it tells you how many missing indexes are showing up for this table total. And then the next column is how many similar missing indexes are showing up for this table. Because what you'll find when you run this query in real life is that quite often SQL Server will come back and ask for say 10 or 15 new indexes on a particular table. And usually you don't wanna create 10 or 15 new indexes on a table because usually that's gonna make that table be way over indexed, have far too many indexes for the workload. And what you're trying to figure out a way to do is combine many of those indexes into one wider index that has more columns in it instead of lots of narrow indexes. So scrolling further to the right here, the next column is equality columns here. And this is showing you all the columns that SQL Server thinks are equality columns in the missing index that it would like to add. So usually this means that these columns are showing up in the where clause of your query or in join columns for your query as being equality columns. And then inequality columns are also columns that are showing up, but instead of being equal to, they're gonna be less than or greater than something. So usually that's in the where clause, but occasionally you'll see that in a join clause. And the way you want to interpret this is this is the order that SQL Server thinks you should create these columns in a new index. And it's not always right. Now, if it's only one column, like first name you see right there, you can pretty much rely on that. But if there's multiple columns here, that might not be accurate. And what you want is you want the most selective column to be first in your index if possible. And there's other queries you can run to try to figure that out. But sometimes I'll just try to create the index the way it wants it here and see how well that works. And then the next column over here are what are called included columns. So these are columns that are not in the leaf level of the index. And usually these are showing up from columns that are just in the select clause of a query as opposed to being in a join or a where clause. So that's where those are coming from most of the time. And then user seeks is a very important column to look at. And this is how many times SQL Server has wanted that index. And if it's a really high number, that's another factor to weigh into whether or not you might want to create this index or not. And then average user cost is showing you the cost of not having this query. So if it's a large table that you're doing a clustered index scan on or a table scan on, the user cost, the average user cost is gonna generally be higher. And you can see a difference here between 18.24 and 0 0.50. That just means that this is probably a larger table and it's more expensive for SQL Server to not have that index. Average user impact is the percentage that the query optimizer thinks that the cost of the query would be reduced by if it had this index. So obviously, higher percentages are more important. And then finally, with SQL Server 2019, you actually get the short query text back from the query. And so this helps you identify the stored procedure name or the actual 
first part of the query text from the query that triggered this. And that's incredibly useful. So now you know, in this case, what sort of procedure is triggering this request. And that can help you make a better judgment whether or not you want to create this index or not. So make sure you don't go in and just create every single index that SQL Server is asking for here because you're going to have way too many indexes and that's going to make your database larger and it's going to make insert, update, delete performance slower. You want to use your judgment and look at the existing indexes that are already on the table and how volatile the table is before you decide to create lots of indexes. So if you use this query in the right manner, it can be extremely valuable and you can find things that can have a huge effect on performance. But if you misuse it, you can actually make your situation worse. So make sure you think about what you're doing before you create lots of indexes because of this query. The next query in the set is query number 33, which is VLF counts. VLF stands for virtual log file. This is going to get the VLF counts for all the databases on the instance. And it's reading from sys.databases and then sysdmdb log info. And that's a DMF that you have to pass the database ID into. So when we run this, it's going to come back and tell us how many VLFs are in each database on the instance, including the system databases. And the reason you care about this is that Every time your transaction log grows, it adds a certain number of VLFs to that transaction log file. And these virtual log files can have an effect on performance. It can hurt write performance to the log file as that log file gets larger and larger with more VLFs. But more importantly, it affects the recovery portion of a database restore and it affects crash recovery. So if you were doing something like restarting SQL Server, all the databases on the instance have to go through crash recovery. And if you have very high VLF counts, crash recovery takes longer. It also affects you if you have a traditional failover cluster instance and you're moving the cluster resources to another node and then restarting SQL Server on that new node. And it's going to take longer for your failover to complete. And then finally, if you're restoring a database from a full database backup, if you have a high VLF count, that's going to make that restore take longer because it's going to go through and do the restore portion of it. And then it goes through the recovery portion at the end. And that's what takes longer if you have a high VLF count. And the way you can fix this if you see high numbers, and by high numbers, I mean above about 200 starts to become a problem and it just gets worse the higher the number gets. But anyways, if you see very high VLF counts for a database, if it's in full recovery model, what you need to do is take a transaction log back up and then try to shrink that log file with DBCC shrink log file. And it might not work the first time, so you might have to do another transaction log back up and then try shrinking it again. And eventually, you'll hopefully get it to shrink to a smaller size, with, which gets rid of those excess VLFs. And then what you'll want to do is manually grow it to the desired size that you want it and do that in large chunks. And then finally, you want to go in and set the auto grow increment for that transaction log file to a larger size, such as 1000 megabytes or 2000 megabytes. And that way it grows in large chunks instead of lots of small growths. And by doing all this, you can reduce your VLF count and keep it lower than it otherwise would be with all the default settings for a SQL Server database. The next query in this set is query number 34, which is CPU usage by database. And this shows you the CPU utilization by database for all the databases on your instance. And one important note here is that it only reflects the CPU usage from the currently cached query plans. So if you flush the procedure clash or the plan cache as a whole, that's going to clear out the stats for this. So let's go ahead and run this and see what it tells us. So I run this on my workstation and it comes back and tells me that AdventureWorks LT 2008R2 is using 96.43% of the CPU. And again, that's just from the query plans that are currently in the plan cache. 
If I was under CPU pressure as a whole, this would show me which database is causing the most pain for my processors. And that's useful information to know. Instead of just guessing, now I have a better idea which database to focus my efforts on by running this query. So our next query is query 35, which is IO usage by database. And this is showing you the total cumulative IO utilization by each database on your current instance. And this is using the system IO virtual file stats DMF that we've talked about before. So this is picking up not just your regular SQL Server IO workload, but also other things like running database backups and running DBCC check DB, anything that's touching those database files goes into these statistics. So this tends to make the larger databases, even if they're not really that active with your normal workload, show up more towards the top of the list here. So let's go ahead and run this query and see what it tells us. And the reason we care about this query, by the way, is that if you're seeing any sort of IO bottlenecks, this helps you understand which database is causing most of the IO pain, except that it's going to be skewed a little bit towards your larger databases. So in this case, we see the database no compression test, and you can see the total IO and megabytes that you've seen against that database. And you can see that it's 97% of the, all the IO for all the SQL Server databases. And then you can see it breaking down by read IO and write IO. So this is very, very read heavy for this particular database. And that's mainly because it's taking full database backups periodically, which is a very read heavy operation. And that's a large database compared to the other ones on the instance. But this can be useful in understanding your IO workload and which database is causing the most IO utilization on your instance. The next query in the set is query 36, which is total buffer usage by database. And this just shows you which databases on your instance are using the most memory in the SQL Server buffer pool. And if I go ahead and kick this off, it'll come back in a few seconds and show me that on my workstation. And I wanna warn you that this can take a while to come back, sometimes a minute or more on a large server with lots of memory in many databases. So anyways, what this is showing me is that no compression test is using the most memory in my buffer pool. And then AdventureWorks LT 2008R2 is using the second most amount of memory. And the reason you would want to pay attention to this query is if you're under memory pressure, if your page life expectancy is low, for example, you would want to run this query and then you would understand which database is using the most memory. And that's very useful information to have. The next query in the set is query number 37, which is version store space usage. And this is showing you which databases are using the most version store space in tempdb. And this typically happens if you're doing something like using snapshot isolation or read committed snapshot isolation, which uses the version store in tempdb instead of using traditional locking for concurrency purposes. Running this query will give you that information. We'll go ahead and kick it off. And in my case, none of my databases are using RCSI or snapshot isolation, so I don't really have an issue here. But if you've got a large active database that's using RCSI in particular, you wanna pay attention to what this query tells you. The next query in this set is query 38, which is top weights. And this shows you the cumulative weight statistics since SQL Server was last restarted or since the weight statistics were cleared with DBCC SQL Perf and clearing the weight stats like you see at the top of this query. And this is a pretty large query. And the reason why it's so large is I have many particular weight types that I filter out because they are what I consider to be benign weight. So you don't need to really worry about. And this is not super useful, this query, if your instance is very idle and just not under any kind of stress. But if your instance is busy and you're having performance problems, this can be a very useful query because it helps you understand what SQL Server is spending most of its time waiting on. And you need to be careful with this query because just because you run it and whatever the top weight statistic is, don't immediately overreact and just start changing settings and doing other things just because of that. You need to do more analysis to 
understand whether that's a good idea or not, but this helps point you in one direction or not to do further research. So we'll go ahead and kick this off and I'll scroll down to see the results. And what we see here is OLEDB is my top weight type. And the reason for that is I'm running Azure Data Studio, running a bunch of queries, and it's sending lots and lots of data to Azure Data Studio, which is a client application. And you'll see the same thing in real life. A lot of times you'll see poorly written applications that pull back way too much data from SQL Server, and you'll see OLEDB weight types as your top weight. My second top weight type is CX Packet, and that often happens because you have a poor indexing strategy in place and SQL Server is looking for more indexes that it doesn't have. That's not always why, but that's one of the main reasons you'll see CX Packet as a top weight type. But the point here is whatever you see for your top weight types right here, look at the weight percentages. And so in this case, 41% of the time it's waiting for OLEDB as the top weight type there. And you want to look at the top two or three weight types and think about what that might mean to you. And sometimes the names of these weight types are sort of deceptive. So async network IO, you might think, oh yeah, that means I've got a slow network. That's usually not what that means. What it really means in most cases is that SQL Server is waiting for the client to finish consuming the data that you've sent to it. So that's another symptom that in this case, just using Azure Data Studio and running all these queries from my local SQL Server machine, it's obviously not a network issue, but it's just waiting. Uh, Azure Data Studio can't keep up with what SQL Server is sending back to it in this case. And over on the far right, there's a help info URL column that will take you to a SQL Skills website that explains what a lot of these weight types mean and what, if anything, you want to do about them. But again, I can't stress enough that you should not run this query and then just start changing settings willy-nilly because that's called knee-jerk performance tuning. And quite often by doing that, you'll make things worse. Our next query is query 39, which is connection counts by IP address. And this just gives you a count of all the SQL Server connections to this instance ordered or grouped by IP address, I should say. And it's reading from sysdm exec sessions and sysdm exec connections, two different DMVs there. So we'll go ahead and kick this off. And it's not gonna be that interesting on my workstation because everything is from my local machine. But what you can see here is that I've got Management Studio open somewhere else here, and I've also got Azure Data Studio open up here, and then SQL Agent has some connections. And then this is the phone home service for SQL Server. So you can see what's happening with a fairly idle machine here, but in real life with real servers, this is useful for figuring out where your load is coming from, what web servers or what application servers, what people's workstations. And also, if somebody claims that an application server can't connect to SQL Server or a web server can't connect, you can use this to confirm or deny that's the case. And this just helps you understand where your workload is coming from. So it can be a useful query for troubleshooting. Our next query is query 40, which is average task counts. And this is a very useful query, especially if your server is running poorly because it's updated, it's continuously updated, and it's gonna show you if you have issues in certain areas. And I'll just go ahead and run the query and then explain what I'm talking about. And by the way, before I do that, it's looking at SysDM OS schedulers. That's a DMV it's reading from. So when we kick off this query, and it's gonna come back and show us that my average task count, average across all my schedulers, by the way, is only one, which is really good. I'd like it to be that low. And then my average runnable task count is zero, which is good. And my average pending disk IO count is also zero, which is what I wanna see. Now, if you see average task counts typically above about 10, that either means that you have lots of activity on your server, it's just really busy, or you might be seeing lots of blocking and even deadlock issues. So really high task counts, average task counts are a warning sign of that. And then if the average runnable task count is above zero, that means that you're typically under CPU pressure because you've got tasks that are in the runnable status and they're waiting for CPU time. And then 
Average pending disk I.O. count means that you're waiting for disk I.O. to complete. And if that's above zero, that's a big sign that your I.O. subsystem is under a lot of pressure or just performing very poorly. And you want to run this multiple times, not just one time, because it's going to change from second to second. And it's just a useful thing to look at when you're under pressure. So then you can see really quickly what SQL Server is most unhappy about. So it's a very handy query in a crisis. Our next query is query number 41, which is detect blocking. And you wanna run this multiple times. Don't just run it once and think, oh, I don't have a blocking issue. And the reason you might think you have a blocking issue is if you ran the previous query in this set and you saw high average task counts for multiple runs of that particular diagnostic query, and when you look at what this thing is looking at, it's looking at SysDM OS waiting tasks. It's also looking at SysDM trans locks, and it's looking at SysDM exec SQL text, and finally, SysDM exec requests. Those are the different DMVs that this query is looking at. And when you run it on an idle system, it's not gonna have any results, obviously. But if you are seeing blocking, it'll tell you the type of lock that you're getting, and then the database that it's in, because this is for an, a, another instance-wide query, and what the blocking object is, and what kind of a lock it's requesting, and then it shows you the waiter SID and how long it's been waiting, and then the waiter batch, so that's the SQL Server batch command that's happening, and then the statement, and then the blocker SID and the blocker batch. So it gives you a lot of useful information about blocking that can help you figure out what might be going on. And the way you can oftentimes improve blocking is by doing some good index tuning. And if that doesn't work, then using read committed snapshot isolation is one of the next steps you might want to look at. Our next query is query number 42, which is CPU utilization history. And this just gives you the CPU utilization history by SQL Server and all the other processes on your machine over the last 256 minutes in one minute snapshots. So this helps you look back in time 256 minutes to see how much CPU your SQL Server instance has been using and also all the other things that might be running on your machine. So it's a pretty handy query. If you're under CPU pressure right now, this can tell you has it been going on for just a few minutes or for quite a long time, for example. And it is looking at SysDMS OS ring buffers to get this information. And I want to point out that sometimes this query comes back with inaccurate results on high core count systems in particular. So every once in a while you run this and it comes back with negative numbers for CPU utilization. And that's a known issue that I don't think is ever gonna be fixed, unfortunately, but most of the time it's very reliable. And so we'll go ahead and kick this off. And on my system where I've mostly been talking and recording here, it's zero for SQL Server almost every minute going back for quite a while. I ran a few queries a little bit ago to get it up to 2% for a little while. But on a real system, you're going to see how much CPU this SQL Server instance that you're connected to is using. And then this column right here shows you how much CPU other processes are using on your system. And then it shows you the time that it took that snapshot. So again, this helps you just get an, an idea of how SQL Server has been doing from a CPU perspective for the last roughly four hours. Our next query is query number 44, which was page life expectancy by Numinode. That's what PLE stands for, by the way. And that's just a, a measure of internal memory pressure. What PLE stands for is page life expectancy, but what it really means is that it's how many seconds does data live in the SQL Server buffer pool before it has to get flushed. And you want higher numbers. And there's old guidance floating around the internet that 300 is a threshold. So if you're below 300, it's bad. And if you're above 300, it's good. That's completely obsolete guidance. It depends on how much memory is in your system and also depends on your workload. And you can't just run this once because maybe somebody just ran a great big query that did a table scan of a huge table and your page life expectancy goes down a lot as a result. So you need to watch what's happening over time and watch as it goes up and down at different times during the day and different days during the week. And a lot of monitoring software keeps track of this so you can see what's been going on historically. So when we run this on my system, 
what we'll see is my page life expectancy is pretty low at the moment. It's only 627. Does that mean I should panic? No, it doesn't because actually I restarted SQL Server a few minutes ago and that's why it's so low because it sets it to zero when you do that and then it slowly climbs over time if nothing else is happening. So if I run it again here, it's going to be higher than 627. Now it's up to 649 and if, if I just leave my server idle most of the time with hardly any workload, that's just going to get larger and larger and larger. So you want to get an idea for what your trend is and what the range is and that way you can figure out if it's getting worse over time and stays low for a long time then you are under some internal memory pressure and that means that SQL Server would like to have more memory to use to cache data in the SQL Server buffer pool. The next query in this set is query 45, which is memory grants pending. And this is another performance counter that we can get to from T-SQL. It's looking at SysDMOS performance counters. And if you ever see this above zero, that's basically SQL Server screaming bloody murder about being under severe memory pressure because it's waiting for a memory grant to do something like run a query, for example. So when I run this, I expect this to come back and show zero right there. And you want to run this multiple times in, on a production server when you're under memory pressure to see if memory grants are actually piling up here. And you don't want that. You never want this to be above zero. And very rarely do you see that unless you're just under severe, sustained memory pressure. Our next query is query number 46, which is memory clerk usage. And this shows you what is using most of the memory in SQL Server. So it's very useful if you feel like you're under memory pressure. So we'll go ahead and run this and talk about what we're seeing when it comes back. And what you expect to see is your top memory clerk type is the one that I'm seeing right here, which is memory clerk SQL buffer pool. And that was added in SQL Server 2012. And that's your SQL Server buffer pool where data is being cached in memory. And you want that to be your highest memory user by far. But what you often will see is one of the top ones is cache store SQL CP right there. And that is ad hoc and prepared queries, you know, as opposed to parameterized queries and stored procedures that are using lots of memory in your memory pool as a whole. And that can bloat up over time if you've got lots of ad hoc queries that have different query plans in the plan cache. And one way you can control that is to enable optimizer ad hoc workloads for the instance. And that helps control that, but it doesn't completely solve the issue, unfortunately, if you have a very heavy ad hoc workload. What you also need to do in many cases is run this command that you see below, dbcc free system cache SQL plans. And I have that running as an agent jobs with many of my clients, and I've done it for many years. And that flushes just the ad hoc and prepared plan cache periodically. And that helps keep that from bloating up and taking up many gigabytes of memory to cache what are often single use query plans that just are wasting memory that could be better used by the buffer pool, for example, to cache data. Our next query is query 47, which is ad hoc queries. And this is going to help you find single use ad hoc and prepared queries that are taking up lots of space in the plan cache. And this is really useful if you have something that's doing lots of ad hoc queries, such as an ORM, for example. So we'll go ahead and run this and see what we see come back. And on my instance, I don't have that much activity that's ad hoc, but you can see the database name and then you can see the query text and you can cut and paste this to another window to look at it in more detail. And then it tells you in this case whether it's a prepared query or an ad hoc query. And then you can see the plan size in kilobytes. And on my workstation, this is not a big deal, but on most production database servers that I've ever looked at, you'll see hundreds or thousands that come back. And this is filtered for just a top 50. And quite often you'll look at that and see many of them look very, very similar. 
And so that's something you might want to go talk to your developers about and say, hey, what are you doing here? Can we maybe convert this to a parameterized query or a stored procedure so we can reuse that same query plan? Because what this is finding when you run this on a production server is you have lots of plans that are similar but not identical. And they all have one different query plan and it's wasting lots of memory in your plan cache. And again, the way you can try to control that is make sure you enable optimize for ad hoc workloads and then run that command dbcc free system cache SQL plans periodically to keep this under control. But at the root cause of it is just the way the queries are being submitted to SQL Server. Our next query is query 48, which is top logical reads queries. And this just returns the top total logical read queries for the entire instance, all the databases on the instance. And this helps you identify which queries and which databases are causing the most memory pressure because logical reads means you're finding the data in the SQL Server buffer pool instead of having to go out to the storage subsystem. And this indirectly calls, causes storage subsystem pressure on top of that. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we have coming back. So when this comes back with a result, it's going to show us that the database name is first, and let me scroll down here so we can see all the results and scroll back and forth. But the database name is the first column, and then the short query text, which might be the beginning of the sort procedure, or the first few characters in the ad hoc query. And then you can see it's ordered by logical reads, total logical reads, and the numbers fall off really quickly here, and that's a pattern you're going to see lots and lots. And if we scroll over to the far right, one of the most useful columns in this is the has missing index column. And this shows me all the queries that are showing up here that have missing index warnings that might be easy wins if you can do some index tuning that actually helps the query out. So this again helps you identify which queries are causing the most internal memory pressure. The next query in the set is query 49 which is top average elapsed time queries. And this just pulls back the top average elapsed time queries for the entire instance, all the databases, and you can see store procedures and non-store procedure queries in the results here. So when we go ahead and run this, what we're going to see is which queries are taking the most average elapsed time. And this is something that users tend to notice. So if you can find a query that's taking 10, 20, 30 seconds and do some query tuning or index tuning on it and make it come back and say less than a second, people tend to notice that and it makes you look good as a DBA. And what you see here is the database name is listed and then a short query text just like some of the similar queries before and then it's ordered by average elapsed time and these elapsed times are again in microseconds not milliseconds so this is taking about less than two tenths of a second right there but still I would want to look for this and see if I could do something you know it's a low-hanging fruit easy tuning opportunity potentially our next query is query number 50, which is UDF stats by database. And UDF stands for user defined function. And specifically, this query is looking for scalar UDFs because scalar UDFs have well known performance issues with SQL Server. Now, SQL Server 2019 has a new feature that automatically inlines many scalar UDFs. So if you're using compatibility level 150 in SQL Server 2019, it will automatically, unless you turn that feature off, inline many scalar UDFs and make them perform much better. So this query will let you find any databases on your instance that are using scalar UDFs and you can see how much they're using them. So let's go ahead and run this query and see what comes back. And what you'll see on my workstation is that the only ones, the only databases that are using scalar UDFs is Microsoft's MSDB system database and there's three different scalar UDFs that it is using. And you can see the execution counts and the elapsed times. So there's not too much you can do about that until Microsoft decides to work on that. But normally on a regular database, you're gonna find quite a few of your user databases have some scalar UDFs in there and finding them and then doing what you can to alleviate them, whether you're on older version of SQL Server or not, because they actually added this DMV in SQL Server 2016, by the way.
So now we've finished with the instance level queries and we switch over to the database specific queries. Now make sure you're connected to a user database that you care about rather than the master system database. That's a very common mistake that people make and that's why I have this comment up here. So now we're gonna go ahead and run query 51 and this is file sizes and space for the current database that you're connected to. And while we wait for that to come back, now it comes back and we can see that it shows you the file name for the database and then the physical name for the file and that gives you the complete path including the file name for the file and then we see the total space or total size in megabytes and the available space in megabytes and what we're seeing here is there's a decent amount of space in the data file and there's lots of space in the log file, and the log file is about eight times as big as the data file, and that means that I probably had a runaway transaction log on that database at some point in the past, and it grew to be much larger than it probably needs to be. And then we can also see the file ID for each file and the file group name. We just have a primary file group in this case, and we can see whether or not it's using percent growth, which is bad. You don't want to use percent growth for your data files or for your log files. And you can also see if it's the default file group and if it's read only or not, and whether or not the is auto grow all files property is turned on. And that's a good idea. If you've got more than one file in a file group talking about data files, it's a good idea to turn that setting on so that way they both grow at the same time and you want them to be the same size. Otherwise, SQL Server tends to use the larger file and ignore the smaller file. The next query in the set is query 52, which is log space usage. And this shows you the log space usage for the current database that you're connected to. And it's looking at a fairly new DMV called sysdmdb log space usage. And it's also looking at sys.databases. So when we run this, it'll come back and show us what's happening with our log space usage. And we can see that here's the name of the database and it's in full recovery model. And we've got roughly eight gigabytes of total log space. We've only used about 32 megabytes of log space. And it also shows you the percentage of log space used and the log space that's been used since the last backup and the log reuse weight description. And why this query is useful is if you have a runaway transaction log, this can help you to understand why that might be happening. And so that's something you wanna pay attention to because otherwise your log can get very large and you can eventually run out of disk space. Our next query is query 53, which is last VLF status. And this uses another relatively new DMF, which is sysdmdb log info. And when we run this query, what it's gonna tell us is what's going on with the last VLF in the transaction log. And the status of that VLF controls whether or not you're gonna be able to shrink that log file if you ever need to. So if you have a really high VLF count, the way to fix it is to shrink your log file. But if you can't shrink it because the last VLF and the log file is active, you're gonna be frustrated. So what you're gonna to need to do is try running a transaction log backup and see if you can shrink it. And you might have other things going on. So sometimes you can do a trick like doing something like reorganizing an index to move where the last VLF is and whether it's, an active, whether it's active or not. So that's why this query is useful. The next query in the set is query 54, which is database scope configurations. And this is a new feature that was added in SQL Server 2016 that gives you the ability to change the behavior at the database level for a lot of things that you can only do at the instance level before. And they added a lot more of these configurations in SQL Server 2019. And it reads from sys.database soap configurations. So we'll go ahead and run this query and see what comes back on a SQL Server 2019 instance. So when this comes back, we can see all these different things here. And some of the ones that were originally in there are things like max degree of parallelism and legacy cardinality estimate, legacy cardinality estimation. And these are both extremely useful because this lets you change those properties for individual databases instead of having it only being an instance wide setting. So it's extremely useful and you need to be aware of these settings for your databases on SQL Server 2016 and newer.
The next query in the set is query 55, IO stats by file. And this lets you drill in to the IO statistics for each one of the files in your current database and see what's been going on with them. And you can see when I've run this query in advance, it shows me the database name and then the logical name for each one of the files in the database and then the file ID and the type description and the physical name that shows you exactly where it's located. And what's interesting about this query is it tells you the number of reads and the number of writes. And if we scroll over to the right, we can also see the megabytes read and the megabytes that have been written. And this helps us understand what's going on from an I.O. perspective. Is it more of a reporting database? Is it more of an OLTP database? And then what's happening with each file in the database? And why you care about this is this lets you configure your I.O. subsystem to properly handle this database's workload if you want to. So if you know you're doing lots and lots of writes, you might want to use RAID 10 instead of RAID 5, for example. So instead of guessing, now we know what's happening with this particular database. The next query in this set is query 56, query execution counts. And this just returns the most frequently executed queries for this database, not the entire instance, but this database only. And this is useful for understanding whether you might have some caching opportunities and also just for understanding your baseline workload. And again, this is only pulling back from queries that are in the plan cache. So when we kick off this query, it'll come back in a couple seconds and then we will see what's going on here. And it's ordered by execution count, obviously. And you get the short query text here and then the total logical reads and average logical reads and so on. And again, I really like this has missing index column because that lets me focus where I can maybe do some index tuning and get an easy win here. But what you're looking for here, and a lot of times when you run this query and share the results with your developers, they'll be surprised by how often something is being called. And sometimes they find logic errors in their code where they're calling a store procedure or query far more often than it actually needs to be just by accident. Next, we have the bad man list, as I like to call it. And this is a series of queries that focuses on the most expensive store procedures from several different perspectives. And the first one in this set is query 57, SP execution counts. And this shows you which store procedures are being called the most often against the current database. And so when I run this query, what's gonna come back is all the store procedures that are being called the most often and you can see here it's ordered by execution count and it shows the store procedure name in the first column and then you get a few metrics about that store procedure such as average elapsed time and average worker time and average logical reads and I always focus on the has missing index column because again that's where you can often find very easy query tuning opportunities and why this particular query is useful is because you can identify which things are being called the most often and maybe they can be cached in the middle tier or maybe there's a logic error and they're being called too often. And just understanding how often these store procedures are called helps you understand your workload and it could be that it suddenly jumps for some reason. So this is nice to know as a baseline. Our next query is query 58, SP average elapsed time. And this is gonna show you the store procedures in the current database that have the highest average elapsed time. And the elapsed time figure is in microseconds, not milliseconds. So when this comes back, it's gonna show us which store procedures in this current database have the highest average elapsed time. And 156,000 is you know less than two tenths of a second, so that's not too long. But a lot of times in real life against an actual database server, you're gonna see much higher average elapsed times. And that's where I like to focus my query tuning and index tuning efforts because you can get a huge return on your investment if you find something like that. The next query in this set is query 59, which is SP worker time. And this is going to show us the store procedures that are cached ordered by total worker time for this database only. So this helps you focus on and figure out which store procedures are using the most CPU on your database. And hopefully, if you're worried about CPU utilization, you've already identified which database is using the most CPU from one of my prior queries. So when this comes back, this shows me the store procedure name, 
and then it's ordered by total worker time. And quite often you'll see a pattern like this where the total worker time trails off very quickly. And by concentrating on the top three or top five results, you can really make a difference if you go and look at each one of those and make some fixes and then run it again and make some fixes. Over time, you will make a real improvement to your CPU utilization for this database. And also it's important, as I always say, to look at the has missing index column to see if there's something easy you can do with index tuning that might affect this store procedure. The next query in the set is query 60, which is SP logical reads. And this is your top cache store procedures in the current database ordered by total logical reads. And logical reads relate to memory pressure because it means you're finding the data in the buffer pool. And so if you're under memory pressure, tuning this is a really good idea. So when we run this query, we're gonna see which ones come back at the top. And what you'll probably see here is as we normally see, the total logical reads trails off very quickly. So we could focus on these top three if we wanted to do some tuning. And also looking at the average log logical reads can be useful because 24,000 logical reads is quite a bit for a lot of store procedures. And if it's being called a lot, that can get expensive really quickly. And then I like to look at the has missing index column as always. So this is a useful query. Our next query is query 61, which is SP physical reads. And this gives you the top cache store procedures ordered by total physical reads. And physical reads means you're having to get the data from disk rather than finding it in the buffer pool. And that's probably what this actually means in this query is that we had to do that the very first time that we ran it. So at any rate, what we're gonna see when we run this query is that we'll see certain ones at the top and usually the numbers trail off very quickly as we typically see. And that's what we see from this column, total physical reads. And also the has missing index column as always is a place to focus your attention. If you get lucky and the ones that show up at the top have missing index warnings, you might be able to fix that with just simply a new index instead of actually even having to do any query tuning. The next query in the set that we're gonna take a look at is query 62, which is SP logical writes. And this is just the top cache store procedures ordered by total logical writes filtered by this database only. So when I run this query, it's gonna come back and show me which store procedures are generating the most write activity against the database. And so you can kind of tell from the names of these store procedures that those are probably doing updates, inserts, or deletes, for example, and they're ordered by total logical writes. And you can see the other metrics get pulled back from this. And the has missing index column is there, but you don't find missing indexes there as often, but it depends on what's happening with your queries. The next query in this set is query 63, SP missing index. And what that means, these are cache store procedures that have missing index warnings. And again, these are ones that are cached in the plan cache and it's filtered by this database. So when I run this, it's gonna tell me all the store procedures in this database that have missing index warnings. And we can see the list right here. And what I could do if I wanted to is I could uncomment this line and then see the actual query plan for that and find the missing index warning. But this is something that's really easy to run and hopefully you can find some good query tuning opportunities from running this query. The next query in the set is query 64, which is top IO statements. And this shows us the top statements within the store procedures that are generating the most IO from the cached query plans for the current database. So when I run this query, it'll come back with a list of store procedures, and then we'll have a column that actually shows us the statement right here for that store procedure that's generating all that IO activity. So if we expanded this far enough over there, we could see the complete select statement that's generating the most IO. And this probably, you know, the one is pretty familiar by now. He has a missing index warning, so that's why this is so expensive. The next query is query 65, which is bad NC indexes, which stands for non-clustered indexes. 
And this is going to show indexes that have more writes than reads. And you want to take a close look at this because if you've got indexes that have lots and lots of writes and zero reads, you might be able to drop that index. Of course, you need to use a little bit of judgment here and understand how long that your instance has been running and whether or not you've seen your complete workload. So if you've been running long enough that you've seen your complete workload and you don't see any reads on a particular index, then it's probably something you want to consider dropping because you're paying the cost to maintain that query and you're not getting any benefit from it. And dropping indexes that you're not using makes your database smaller eventually. It frees up space inside of the data file and reduces the burden of index maintenance on that database. The next query in the set that we want to take a look at is query 66, which is missing indexes. And this is similar to the previous missing index query, except that it's filtered down to just this database. And also there's a couple of extra columns added to this. So we'll go ahead and kick this off and see what comes back. And this is again, very, very useful, but it's very easy to misuse. So be careful when you're running this. Not that it's dangerous to run, but it's easy to misinterpret the results and do the wrong thing. So this comes back and it's ordered by index advantage, which is a calculated column based on several different factors. And it shows you the last user seek. It's important that you look at that and figure out, is that just a few seconds or a few minutes ago? Or is it several hours or even several days or weeks ago? Because that helps you figure out if it's part of your regular workload or not. And then the next column shows you the database and the schema and the table involved. And then you can see the number of missing indexes that are showing up for that table and then the similar missing indexes that are showing up for that table, and then the equality columns right here, and the inequality columns, and the included columns of what SQL Server thinks it would like for an index. And the two rows that I, the two columns that I added are the table name column over here on the far right, and then the table rows column because you need to be careful when you're creating new indexes on large tables, especially with SQL Server Standard Edition that doesn't have online index operations. And one thing that I wanted to point out here is if we scroll back over the right here and expand this column, what we'll see is we've got a table called Event Log and there's another table called event log compressed. And those two tables have identical data, but the compressed one is using page data compression. That's the only difference. And what's happening here, if you look closely, right here, the average total user cost for the non-compressed version is 18.32. And the average total user cost for the compressed version is only 4.76. And the reason for that is that the page data compression is so effective in reducing how much data has to be read if we're doing a table scan or a clustered index scan, is, which is probably what's happening for that particular store procedure. And so that's just some evidence of how effective data compression can be when the data is identical except for the compression that's being used. The next query in the set is query 67, which is missing index warnings. And this is going to show you any queries or store procedures that have missing index warnings in the plan cache for the current database. So when I run this, this will come back and show me whatever I have. In this case, it's all just store procedures. And each one of these store procedures has a missing index warning. And you can see how many times it's been executed right there, which is useful for understanding how important it might be and you can see the size of the query plan. And then here's the actual query plan XML. And you can drill into that and get the missing index details. So this will sometimes find missing index warnings or missing index opportunities that you don't see from the previous query. The next query we're going to take a look at is query 68, which is buffer usage. And this just shows you what indexes are using the most space in the buffer pool in the current database. So when I run this query, it's going to come back and show me the file group name and then the schema name. And then it's going to show you the object name, which is the table name in this case. 
and then the index ID. And if it's index ID 1, that's a clustered index. And if it's some other index ID, it's a non-clustered index. But it shows you the buffer size in megabytes. That's how much space in the buffer pool is used by that index. And then the buffer count and the row count and the compression type. And what I wanted to focus on here is what I talked about in the previous query. There's a table called event log in this database. And there's a table called event log compressed. And you can see that the clustered index, and you can see that the clustered index is using page compression here and no compression there. So then you can see that the buffer size is 186 megabytes here and only 43 megabytes. So we're getting about four and a half to one compression. And this also is more evidence that when you use page compression, it's compressed on disk and it stays compressed in the buffer pool. It only gets decompressed when you change the data in that index. The next query in the set is query 69, which is table sizes. And this is going to give you the names of the tables along with their row counts and compression status. And this helps you find possible candidates for SQL Server data compression. That's one thing I like to use it for. So right now it's showing me each one of the tables along with a schema that it belongs to and the row count. And then whether or not it's using any kind of SQL Server data compression, whether it's none or page or row data compression. And if I see tables that are large with many rows and they're not using compression, that's going to pique my interest. And I'm going to do a little bit more investigating to figure out, hey, is the data in this table relatively static? And is it compressible? And, and that's true. Then I might want to be able to look at using data compression on that index. The next query in the set is query 70, which is table properties. And this is going to show you every table in the current database along with every index for every table and some interesting properties for each one of those. So we'll go ahead and kick this off. And when it comes back, what we're going to see is the object name is the table name. And then you can see how many rows are in each table and then get the index ID for each one of the indexes. And then we can see the index data compression. So most of these don't have any compression, but a few of them have page data compression. And you can also see things like the create date, is replicated means, is it part of a replication topology? Is it being tracked by change data capture? And so on. And if we scroll over to the right, we can see a few more properties for these tables. So for example, remote data archive that has to do with stretch databases. So you get a lot of information about all the tables in your database, which can be useful if you're trying to understand the schema of your database. Our next query is query number 71, which is statistics update. And this just tells you when the statistics were last updated on all the indexes you have on your tables and indexed views. So we'll go ahead and run this query and see what we get back. So when this comes back, it shows you the object name. So you have the schema and then the table or index view name, and then it tells you the object type, and then it gives you the actual name of the index. And then it's ordered by statistics date. And that was the last time that the statistics were updated on that object. And you want to keep your statistics up to date as much as possible so the query optimizer can do a good job of coming up with a good quality query plan. And if you're not doing automatic statistics updates or manual statistics updates frequently enough, you can have out of date statistics that make it harder for your query optimizer to do a good job. Our next query is query number 72, which is volatile indexes. And this just shows you the most frequently modified indexes and statistics in the current database. And when we run this, it'll come back and show us the object name for each one of these that has lots of modifications and the object ID and what it is. It's a user table for all of these. And then the name of the statistics that we're talking about here and you can see how many rows are in that table and then how many rows were sampled and then the modification counter. So why you care about this is if you're thinking about using data compression, you don't want to really use data compression on indexes that get modified a lot. 
Now, I should clarify that if you're doing lots of inserts to a table, it's okay. But if you're doing lots of, ins of updates and deletes, it's not so okay. And also, if you know which indexes are seeing a huge amount of updates, you might want to think about putting the tables that have those indexes in their own file group with their own data files. And then possibly you could locate that on really fast storage that's optimized for write. So there's lots of reasons why you care about this sort of information. The next query in this set is query 73, which is index fragmentation. And this is gonna return fragmentation info for all the indexes that are bigger than 2,500 pages in the current database. So when I run this, it'll come back and it shows you the database name in the first column, and then the schema name, and the object name, which is the table name, and then the index name and index ID, and it tells you whether it's a non-clustered index or a clustered index, and then you see the average fragmentation in percent. And all of these indexes in this database have extremely low fragmentation. Now, I still think you should do a little bit of index maintenance because certain queries perform better when you don't have index fragmentation, regardless of what kind of storage you have. But you also don't want to go overboard and do way too much index maintenance because index maintenance causes a lot of I.O. activity. And if you have things in place like availability groups, it can cause problems for that because it's generating so much transaction log activity. And then one last column I want to point out here is this allow page locks column. And you want that to always be one because if you don't allow page locks on an index, you're not going to be able to reorganize it. And sometimes you'll find indexes that have this set to zero. And a lot of times the reason why is because way back in SQL Server 2005, there was a bug in SQL Server Management Studio. So if you went and created an index using the SSMS GUI, it would set that to zero by accident. And so there's lots of indexes I'll see on old databases that have been upgraded over the years that have that property set. And it's just a property change and you can make without having to rebuild the index. And then you'll be able to reorganize it if you ever need to instead of having to rebuild it. The next query in the set is query 74, which is overall index usage for reads. And this gives you which indexes in the current database have the most reads. And that means they're the most effective indexes for select queries. So we'll go ahead and run this query and see what comes back and talk about the columns that are in there. So this comes back and shows us the object name, which is the table or indexed view, and then the index name along with the index ID. And then you can see the number of user seeks and the number of user scans and then user lookups. So then you get a total number of reads for that index. And then you see the total number of writes for that index. And again, the ones that have lots and lots of reads are doing a good job for you for select queries. And if you see indexes here that have zero reads and lots of writes, you want to think about possibly dropping that index after you do some more investigation and as long as you've been running long enough to have seen your complete query workload. And so here's an example of where you'd want to be careful there. If you had some indexes that were only used to run monthly reporting queries and they weren't being used the rest of the month and you drop them, that might make those reporting queries take a long, long time to execute. So you need to be careful about that. So that's why you want to make sure you've been running long enough that that doesn't happen to you. And another reason why this is an interesting query is if you see tables that have lots and lots of reads and very few writes, then you can probably be more aggressive about doing things like data compression. And you can also be more aggressive about adding more indexes to that table. Whereas if you see a table with lots and lots of writes, you want to be less aggressive about using data compression and adding additional non-clustered indexes. The next query in this set is query 75, which is overall index usage ordered by writes. And this is very similar to the previous query, just ordering by total writes instead of by total reads. And when we run this query, it'll come back and show us which indexes in the current database have the most writes. And why you care about that, again, is if you have lots of writes against a particular index, 
that means that table is pretty volatile and you want to be more cautious about doing data compression on it. You also want to be more cautious about adding additional non-clustered indexes to it. And if you know that a particular table sees a lot of write activity, you might consider moving it to its own file group that could be located on faster storage that's optimized for writes. The next query in this set is query 76, XTP index usage, and that refers to in-memory OLTP index usage. And this is a feature that I don't see in that many people using, unfortunately. I very seldom see results coming back from this when I have this run on client systems. So take that for what it's worth, but we'll go ahead and run this query. And in my case, I know I don't have any in-memory OLTP tables in this database, but if I did, it would show me the object name and the index ID and index name and what kind of an index it was and some statistics about those in-memory OLTP indexes. The next query in this set is query number 77, which is column store index physical stat. And this gives you some information about your column store indexes and how they're being used and how they're doing in terms of condition. And this is another feature that's not used that often. It gets more usage than in-memory OLTP, but still not that many people are using column store, at least the people that I've been dealing with over the last several years. I think adoption of this feature is increasing though, so I don't think it's really a dead feature. But at any rate, We'll go ahead and run this query, and I know that I don't have any column store indexes in this little tiny database, but if I did, it would show me the table name and the index name and the index ID and a bunch of other statistics about those column store indexes. And if you really want to know everything there is to know about column store indexes, Nico Nigebauer has a blog where he's done well over 100 posts on everything you could possibly think about related to column store indexes. So he is probably the foremost expert in the world on column store indexes. And they're really useful for reporting workloads, for example. So don't give up on this feature. The next query in the set that we're gonna take a look at is query 78, which is lock weights. And this just gives you the cumulative lock weights for the current database. And this is very useful if you're seeing signs of blocking or deadlocking. It'll show you which indexes and which tables are seeing the most lock weights. And it's pulling from sysdmdb index operational stats and then sys.objects and sys.indexes. And this really helps you find problems with blocking and locking. So we'll go ahead and run this. And unfortunately, I know that I won't get any results because I don't have enough of a workload on my workstation here, but it would show me the table name and the index name and the index ID and what partition it was in, and then the total row lock weights, and then the total page lock weights, and then the total lock weights. And in my experience, the best way to attack this, if you see lots of lock weights on a particular index or table, is see what's going on with the indexing for that table. So for example, if you are having to do a clustered index scan on a big table because you're missing a non-clustered index that you could have otherwise used, that's gonna lock that table for a period and cause more lock weights. So, and also if you have more indexes than you need on a table, that's gonna cause additional lock weights. So getting your indexes tuned properly tends to really help reduce your lock wait time. Our next query is query 79, UDF statistics. And this is looking at scalar UDF execution statistics for the current database. So I'll go ahead and run this and then talk about what it means. So what's gonna come back here is I have one scalar UDF that I have doing some stuff in this database. And I've got, here's the name of it right here. And then the execution count is nine. And then you can see the total worker time and the total logical reads and total physical reads and then total elapsed time and average elapsed time. And then the plan cache time for that scalar UDF query plan. And 
One way that you can get rid of this for many Scala UDFs is if you have your database in database compatibility mode 150 for SQL Server 2019. If you do that, you get automatic Scalar UDF inlining that works for many but not all Scalar UDFs. And so right now I've got the database and compatibility level 140 on purpose. And if I switch it to 150 and then ran those scalar UDFs again, I would get no results back in this query for that particular scalar UDF because I've already tried it and this one is not inlineable. Another thing you can do, if I switch over here, here's how you would switch your database compatibility level back and forth. And then here's another option you have. One of the scoped database configuration options is T SQL Scala UDF inlining and you turn it on or off. So if you turn it off, that will also have the effect of disabling that feature. The next query in this set is query 80, which is inlineable UDFs. And this query lets you see if you have any inlineable scalar UDFs in the current database. And if you have your database compatibility level set to 150, you're probably not gonna see very many show up because most of them are already gonna be inlined. But if you don't have it set to 150, you can run this query and find out what's happening here. And one use case for this is imagine that you're running on say SQL Server 2016 and you're thinking about upgrading to SQL Server 2019. Well, you could take a backup of that database and restore it on a 29 2019 instance and then execute your workload against it and then run this query and see which UDFs are showing up as in is inlineable. And if you see that, that means that you're going to get the benefit of that automatic scalar UDF inlining if you're in database compatibility mode 150. Our next query is query number 81, which is query store options. Query store is a very valuable feature that was added to the product back in SQL Server 2016. But despite that, still there's many people out there who are not using query store, either because they don't understand it, or they're afraid of it, or whatever reason the case may be. It's slowly increasing its adoption rate, but not that many people are using it in my experience. And it's really valuable because what it lets you do is it lets you see what's happening to execution statistics over time that survive restarting SQL Server. Because with DMV queries, when you restart SQL Server, you lose all that information. Query Store keeps that information and lets you do things like freeze a good query plan to avoid problems with plan instability. So after that little preamble, let's go ahead and run this and this will show us what's going on with Query Store for the current database. Now you've got to enable Query Store for individual databases. It doesn't just happen when you create a new database, but it's showing that Query Store is in a read-write state, which is what we want, and then the max storage size is only 100 megabytes in this case, and we're using 21 megabytes. And you want to keep an eye on that because if you fill up your max storage size for Query Store, Query Store switches to read only, and you're not going to be collecting any new information about your query execution. And that's not a good thing if you're actually using Query Store the way it's designed to be used. The next query in this set is query 82, which is input buffer. And this uses a fairly new DMF called sys DM exec input buffer. And this is a replacement for the old DBCC input buffer that's a lot more versatile. So when you run this, it shows you your session IDs and then the database name and the login time, along with some other statistics about what's going on. And then here's the input buffer. And unlike the old DBCC input buffer, it doesn't truncate the command, so you get the complete command from that SPID. So it's pretty useful. The next query in this set is query 83, which is resumable index rebuild. And this is a new feature that was added in SQL Server 2017, and it was enhanced in SQL Server 2019. But it lets you see if you've got any indexes that are resumable, and if you've gotten any of those running, it'll show you how far along they are. And if you have any that you've paused, you'll also be able to see it here. 
So we'll go ahead and run this query, and I don't have any here, but it would show you the object name and the index ID and index name, and then some other information, including the percent complete and when it started. So this is useful information if you've got really large tables that you want to be able to pause an index rebuild operation that was running against them. The next query in the set is automatic tuning options. It's query number 84. And this shows if you are using automatic tuning, which is a feature that was added in SQL Server 2017, and it's only for Enterprise Edition. But this feature requires that query store is enabled on the database. And we'll go ahead and run this query and see what comes back. And the only thing you can do with SQL Server 2017 and SQL Server 2019 is either enable or disable force last good plan. And what that does is if query store notices that suddenly you get a query plan that is regressed and it's using more CPU than it used to, it will attempt to force the last good plan that was using less CPU. And then it checks to see if that's actually helping. And if it isn't helping, it'll unforce it. So it's essentially automating what you can do to force the last good plan with SQL Server 2016. And again, you have to have Query Store running or else this feature won't work. And this automatic tuning feature also is an Enterprise Edition only feature. The last query in this set, which happens to be the last one in the set, is query 85, which is recent full backups. And this shows you a lot of useful information about the 30 most recent full database backups for the current database. So when I run this query, it comes back and shows me the machine name, the server name, and then the name of the database, and then the recovery model for the database, and how big it would be without backup compression, and then the compressed backup size, and then you get the compression ratio, and then you can see whether or not you have backup checksums enabled, which is a really good idea, and whether or not it was a copy-only backup, and then you see the encryptor type. So if you had an encrypted backup, it would show what kind of backup encryption you were using, and then we can see the backup elapsed time in seconds, and when the backup finished, and then the backup location. And it's really important you pay attention to the backup location because normally you want to see it going to a drive letter or a UNC file path, something like that. But if you see something that looks more like a GUID there, that probably means that something external to SQL Server, like backup exec, for example, is doing backups that you might not know about that could be causing problems for you. So this helps you catch that if something is doing that external to SQL Server. We've made it through all those queries, and I really want to thank you if you've hung in there and listened to all this. And I appreciate you showing up and listening and watching this. If you have any questions that I haven't answered during the session, please feel free to reach out email or on Twitter and ask me questions about this. So this is something I really enjoy doing and I appreciate you attending. Thank you very much.